Isaiah 19, I'll read the first four verses. An oracle concerning Egypt. Behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud and comes to Egypt, and the idols of Egypt will tremble at his presence, and the heart of the Egyptians will melt within them. And I will stir up Egyptians against Egyptians, and they will fight each against one another, and each against his neighbor, city against city, kingdom against kingdom, and the spirit of the Egyptians within them will be emptied out, and I will confound their counsel, and they will inquire of their idols and the sorcerers and the mediums and the necromancers, and I will give over the Egyptians into the hand of a hard master, and a fierce king will rule over them, declares the Lord God of hosts. Well, this chapter continues the oracle against the nations, and we saw in the last chapter uh, the oracle uh, concerning Cush, which was kind of connected to Egypt here, uh, the message is directed at Egypt itself. And the context is uh, Judah, under pressure from Assyria, is being tempted to look to Egypt as a potential ally. And uh, the very clear message of this chapter is there's no security found in looking to Egypt. But there's more going on here because uh, while the first half of the chapter is a typical judgment against the nations, the second half of the chapter, we see that there is hope for even Egypt, uh, this uh, nation that is not directly connected to Israel, but is uh, obviously connected because of its history. There's hope for this nation through repentance and incorporation. And uh, I guess those two aspects are the two aspects of prophetic preaching, Isaiah and the other prophets in the Bible, uh, judgment and salvation. So let's look at the uh, the first half of the chapter concerned with uh, judgment on um, Egypt. And again, the message is that Egypt would be an unreliable ally for Judah because uh, it is um, under uh, God's judgment. And uh, at this uh, at time, uh, even at this time, it's ruled by another nation. It's really ruled by the Ethiopians. And there are many more fierce kings uh, to come, verse 4, I will give over the Egyptians into the hand of a hard master and a fierce king will rule over them. Uh, so uh, we've seen that there's kind of inner turmoil in Egypt already in verses 2 to 3. So why would uh, Judah trust in them? And Barry Webb in his commentary points out that there are three crucial weaknesses that make Egypt an unreliable ally. In verses 1 to 4, uh, it seems to be because of their uh, religion, that's the first weakness, their religion, their polytheistic religion, which uh, is uh, uh, marked by all the different idols of uh, Egypt, and that leads to disunity. So idols uh, leads to everyone doing uh, their own thing, and that seems to be the um, uh, the case in verses 1 to 4. Everyone's doing their own thing. And everyone is fighting against each other. There's no uh, unity. Uh, secondly, in verses 5 to 10, is their dependence on the Nile. And so when the Nile uh, dries up, well, that's, um, uh, that's the country gone uh, with it. So verse 5, the waters of the sea will be dried up and the river will be dry and parched. Its canals will become uh, foul and the branches of uh, Egypt's Nile will diminish and dry up. So then uh, there's nothing more for the nation uh, to rely on. But then in verses 11 to 15, uh, the other weakness that Egypt has is false uh, wisdom. And uh, you can see it. Uh, the princes of Zoan are utterly foolish. The wise counsels of Pharaoh give stupid counsel. Uh, there is uh, this uh, lack of real wisdom. And again, we uh, there's lots of resonances here back to uh, the time of uh, the Exodus and uh, some of these aspects were picked up in the, the, the plagues and the advice that uh, we saw in, in that book. And uh, Egypt failed then against the Lord. And uh, here, um, that is underlined in the final verse, verse 15. There will be nothing for Egypt that head or tail, palm branch or reed may do. So why would you rely on this nation? But as I said, the second half of the chapter, verses 16 to 25, uh, Isaiah seems to move beyond the immediate horizon of Egypt as a potential ally for Judah, and he's warning against that, to uh, the end time and what hope there is for Egypt as there's hope for other nations. We've seen that back in chapter 2, verses 2 to 4, this idea that there is hope for all the nations. In these verses, five times that little phrase, in that day, in that day, is, is mentioned. 
and uh, so we're we're pointed forward. And uh, it seems to be that uh, Egypt will wake up and will tremble and come in fear uh, to the Lord of hosts. And so uh, they will um, uh, they will realize that it's the Lord who's against them, and they'll respond in right fear uh, to Him. And then in verse eighteen, uh, they will be incorporated. Uh, into uh, Judah in the sense that they will be under the Lord's protection. Verse 18, in that day there will be five cities in the land of Egypt that speak the language of Canaan, that speak uh, the language of, uh, of God's people, and they swear allegiance wonderfully to the Lord of hosts. One of these will be called the city of destruction, or if you look in the footnote, it could be the city of uh, the sun, which is a slightly different idea than the city of destruction. It seems to be that that's the idea. It's a city uh, marked by hope. And then in verses 19 to 22, you'll see what this uh, incorporation in God's people will look like. And uh, it mentions things like uh, altars and, and vows that the, the people themselves will make vows to the Lord and they'll, uh, they'll make altars to the Lord. Uh, but wonderfully, the Lord himself, verse 21, will make himself known to the Egyptians. He'll reveal himself to them. And the Egyptians will know the Lord in that day and they'll worship and they'll sacrifice and uh, Verse 22, the Lord will strike Egypt, but it's striking and healing. Uh, and they will return to the Lord and he will listen to their pleas for mercy and heal them. What a wonderful vision that this nation uh, will be healed by uh, the Lord. And then uh, verse 23 is this uh, wonderful picture of harmony between Israel, Egypt and Assyria. These three nations which are very much bound up with this kind of international uh, conspiracy and war at, at the moment. And then uh, verses 24 to 25 is a blessing for Egypt and Israel, a blessing, verse 24, in the midst of the earth, whom the Lord of hosts has blessed, saying, blessed be Egypt, my people. Again, very striking. Assyria, the work of my hands, Israel, my inheritance. So just tucked away in this uh, chapter that we might sort of read in our Bibles and think, oh, this is just an oracle against Egypt. It doesn't apply to me. Here is this wonderful picture of end time blessing for these nations as representative of all the nations. And it's this vision. It's this vision uh, that uh, spurs us on to uh, proclaim the gospel uh, to the nations, knowing that God has uh, a vision for all the nations to be re rightly related to him uh, through his son, the Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Our Father, we praise you for the vision of this uh, chapter and the hope that it holds out uh, for all the nations. And uh, we thank you for that. And we pray that we would give ourselves to the work of mission uh, for the name of the Lord Jesus to be known among all the nations and for them to be blessed through him. In Jesus' name. Amen.